have suggest that I'm getting old. Uh, we, I came with the three other colleagues. We arrived, I think, on uh, at around three in the morning at the hotel, and uh, they are tougher than me, so they managed to wake up and join you. But I got stuck at the hotel. But nevertheless, um, as Mama Du mentioned, uh, there are a whole number of things uh, that uh, make me really, really happy and proud, you know, to be here today. Um, when the Codestria Governance Institute began in 1995, uh, I was uh, just finishing my undergraduate studies uh, uh, in, in Nairobi. And uh, two years later, in 1997, I was actually a, a member of the third Codestria General, I mean Codestria uh, Governance Institute. Uh, at the time, uh, uh, sorry, are we having translation? Interpretation issues. Okay. Okay. So I was uh, lucky to be a part of the 1997 Governance Institute, uh, whose focus was actually the political economy of conflict. And my first ever peer-reviewed published article uh, came through this particular Governance Institute. So it really gives me pleasure to be back, uh, close to uh, more than a decade after, actually. Uh, to be a part of this uh, particular institute and incidentally also to be dealing with issues to do with security. Uh, as Mamadou mentioned, I teach at the University of Nairobi uh, in the Institute for Development Studies. I'm a senior research fellow there. Um, I also am the director of the African Leadership Center. And very briefly, just to mention that the African Leadership Center is a, a joint initiative between King's College London and the University of Nairobi. It is a, a center at whose core is the study of issues to do with peace and security. And uh, we've been doing this initially in London and then in Nairobi for the last nine years. And uh, I'm barely uh, two months old in office as the director, but I've been associated with the initiative for a, for a, for a long time. Uh, I make the assumption, obviously, that most of you are coming to us uh, from African universities. And uh, anyone who has spent his or her time in an African university can relate to a whole set of core challenges uh, relating to how you get to produce knowledge in Africa. And uh, as an, a former executive member, of, uh, executive committee member of CODESA, we went through a whole lot of uh, sessions discussing some of those challenges. Uh, perhaps just to conclude, for me, CODESA provides uh, that rare hope, uh, that rare uh, legitimacy to the knowledge that uh, we produce in Africa. And uh, I think it should be a proud moment for all of us, uh, one, to be a part of, a part of the Codestria network, but more importantly, really, to be a part of a network that speaks on behalf and for the continent in ways that are transformative, in ways that are valid, and in ways that are relevant to the African experience. So really, thank you very much, and uh, I hope that uh, that provides a, a basic introduction of what I do and who I am. Thank you, Godwin. So um, we are in the position, so we have to have a screen over there. Also, so those who are here, can you join the other side so, so that we can be more in a position? Someone can come here, since Godwin. Okay. okay, so thank you very much again uh, for this opportunity. I would like to, uh, to, to begin by mentioning very from a, a project that uh, we have been conducting at the African Leadership Center uh, for, for, for a while. And uh, one of the results of that project was a conference that we organized uh, in June in Nairobi uh, on the theme of security and society uh, in Africa. Uh, the idea of the conference was to begin to rethink the field of security studies and to begin to provide uh, perhaps alternative ways of beginning to frame uh, 
I, I would be too ambitious if I said that we are saying anything that hasn't been said before. But certainly uh, what we seek to do uh, through this project is to begin not just to take stock of uh, what has been happening with security studies, but also to begin to think how security studies can begin to be embedded within an understanding of uh, general transformations that are taking place within African societies. And so from a methodological point of view, and I think we'll come back to this, uh, I would not hesitate to make the assertion that uh, an interdisciplinary, indeed a multidisciplinary approach uh, seems to me to be uh, an important way of rethinking security issues in Africa. Uh, but even more importantly, uh, because uh, security issues do not happen in the air, they do not happen in heaven, they happen in our own communities. And precisely because they happen in our own communities, um, rather than emphasizing uh, individuals, rather than emphasizing the state and all that, uh, the question that I would like us to begin to think about would be, what happens to security studies when you begin to locate it within society, when you begin to think about it, not simply as a political process, not simply as an economic challenge, but more importantly as a societal and a social uh, issue. And so some of the key messages I would like to throw around uh, for discussion would be as indicated uh, in that PowerPoint presentation. To begin really to think about major transformations in African societies in recent times and how those have questioned and complicated the idea that it's the state that provides security, and that it's society that receives security. Uh, it's almost like, you know, um, we sit and expect that security will be cooked in some kitchen somewhere and delivered on the table for us. And it seems to me that that assumption is no longer very accurate. And I say that with due respect to the fact that uh, there are major developments, changes that have occurred in relation to security studies, especially with the intervention of the UNDP notion of human security. As a consequence of the first message, I would also like to put on the table the argument that framing the security question in minimalist terms as a state project really reflects a very narrow, narrow elite project and elite focus the focus on maintaining law and order. And the societal transformations that I'm talking about have begun to question that minimalism. Number three, that societal security concerns have assumed greater urgency given the security challenges emanating from or due to societal transformations. There are too many things that are happening in our societies. Our societies are demanding to be a part of the security visioning, security framework, and security discourse. And that we can no longer continue to assume those transformations. They are a part of the democratic demands that our societies are asking for. And more recently, and as a final message that I would like to run through this presentation today and tomorrow, is that we now are experiencing new security threats. Those threats are expressed as though they are targeting communities. But in fact, the target of communities is supposed to be sending a message to the state. I'm making an allusion to things like uh, the terror uh, attacks that are proliferating everywhere on the continent, but especially in two key countries and in two key regions, the Western region and the Eastern region. They express themselves as though they are attacking communities. You wake up and there is a bomb in a market somewhere or in a community somewhere on the margins of, of, of a country. 
although they seem like they are targeting communities, in fact, they are targeting the state and seeking to send a message to the state. What does that mean for our own thinking around security? So between today and Thursday, I would like this to be the key running questions that will guide our discussion. Because I think that if I'm going to make an intervention into this topic, you need to understand what kinds of questions are motivating uh, my presentation. So one of the questions is, if we make the assumption that transformations are happening in society, what is the nature of that transformation? And how is that transformation beginning to alter state society relationships? And in what way is that transformation and the altering that is taking place shifting the idea of security provision? This is going to be my main presentation today. Then the second question, what are the existing frameworks of security provision? both nationally and regionally? And how effective are they in guaranteeing security to the generality of citizens? That is going to be the subject of my presentation tomorrow. And then on Thursday, I will seek to address the question, what are the methodological implications of these shifts for the study of security? I would like to underline methodological implication, and I would like to underline study, especially because we are conducting this governance institute around a concern of how knowledge is produced. And I think on Thursday we need to focus on that. Where are you coming from? How is your training in relation to security studies? Is it the same for men and women, for instance? Um, security studies tend to be thought of as a male domain. It's a masculine endeavor where women need to be absent except when they are talking about that very specific part of it called human security that has to do with the welfare of the individual. Mm -hmm. Is that any longer a tenable position to continue with? So that, that, those are the questions that I would like us to, to run through. Now going back to the first question. For a very long time, we've worked with the idea that security is a state project. Security provision is a state project. And you can actually begin to look at the nature of the state in Africa, especially its history. And you will begin to understand that the core principle around state formation processes has been something to do with how you manage violence, how you manage force. Essentially then, that notion of security is understood as a political issue that has to do with the management of power and its legitimation. That notion, I will argue, goes back to an old 17th century idea. If you begin to read the story of state formation processes, you begin to notice that it is that focus on power and on control of violence that defined the state formation processes everywhere. They were not the same, but it's a running theme that is there. And over time, this notion has been questioned by a whole number of actors. The significant one of, of them, of course, being the human security approach, which the UNDP put together. Uh, most of us do not remember that when the UNDP is packaging this notion of human security, they are drawing from a whole range of researches that had been conducted prior to the UNDP. So we really don't get to deal with the fact that there is a whole background to the human security approach. But basically its core message was that the 17th century project of state formation and the focus on control and monopoly of all means of legitimate violence undermines the alternative focus which needs to be on, on a range of social and human issues that are not, be, were not being given attention to. 
And that questioning was useful because it began to change the way international organization paid attention to the notion of security. And so there is a debate in the literature and security studies between a narrow notion of security and a wider notion of security. And whether security studies remains the same thing if you begin to open up to a whole range of the seven points that the UNDP was putting on the table when it came up with the idea of human security. And for a very long time, therefore, we have gone through discussions around whether it is security as defined by the state in relation to legitimate uses of violence or security from a human-centered perspective. We have had that debate and very interesting uh, perspectives have come out of it. What tends to be missed out is that whether you are thinking about security as defined by the state or whether you are thinking security as defined from a human-centered approach, that all these things are happening within society, societies that have a history, societies that have different interests that play along when you are thinking about security. And so what the key argument I want us to begin to think about is that it's not a dismissal of the state and its role in security provision. It's not a dismissal of the human security alternative to it, but rather what happens to this thinking when you put it within an analysis of more contemporary transformations in society, some of which, I would dare say, had not been anticipated. <coughs> the fact that somebody could easily hijack a plane and ram it into a building was a part of the kind of Hollywood movies. It was never in the imagination of people that it could actually happen. Or that somebody could go into a shopping mall in an upmarket estate in Nairobi and simply begin to slaughter people. It was not in our imagination. Or that due to the youth bulge, a good many of our youth who are on the margins of society would begin to think about illicit ways of earning a living, largely because their society does not provide an alternative. Those are some of the things that are happening in our societies today. And part of my cynicism is that I'm not too sure that the tools we have, both in the human security and in the state security approaches, are adequately prepared to begin to deal with these things. And so uh, I'll just, I want us to, in, to invite ourselves into that analysis. The point I would like to extract from that, therefore, is that these particular transformations have, among other things, forced a rethinking of the nature of the relationship between the state and society. If you come from within political science, this is a long-standing debate. What is the nature of state-society relationships? And we always make the assumption that there is a contract binding state to society, expecting that society and the state will finally balance those relationships in a way that facilitates the greater well-being of everybody. Well, the democratic transitions of the 1970s, late 70s, but more importantly, late 80s and 90s, began to question how that state-society relationship was being negotiated. And across the continent, perhaps in a way that had not been anticipated, across the continent, there were major questions about how that contract was being realized. You could say it was the result of the uh, no glass notes without prestroika, you know, the huge discussion at the Carter Center, uh, program of African studies at Carter Center, where they said, we need not just political transition, I mean, economic uh, transformation, but also political transition. You could go back to those notions. But basically, whichever way you look at it, the nature of state society relation altered in significant ways in the 1990s, as across the continent, very many of our communities began to demand greater openness on how governance was being conducted in those places. So if we agree that those, the nature of that state-society relationship has altered in significant ways, 
The question then become, becomes, has that shifted concerns about insecurity in our communities? What basically comes out of there is that there are key elements of this state security project that begin to be questioned vigorously. The old Weberian idea that the monopoly of legitimate forms of violence is the defining element of how states become and how states are recognized across the board. Again, security studies have tended to be discussed largely within the framework of international relations theories. Yeah? And that analysis has tended to focus primarily on the Weberian theory that you become a part of the international community precisely because you can guarantee that you control all forms of legitimate violence in your zone. And only if you can do that, do you then qualify to have a seat and be recognized under the principles of reciprocity within the international framework. Well, some countries have taught us that uh, you can meet all those obligations, but actually never be a part of the international. I'm talking about Somaliland, for instance. Uh, you want to ask a question? No, thank you. Uh, uh, I mean, you states, state formation processes take different forms historically, okay? Uh, and we can um, we can do an analysis across the board from West Africa into you know um, into the Sudan all the way into Southern Africa historically, and we'll find different interpolations of forms of statehood, okay? But however, that's not my point. My point is that if you begin to understand the nature of the framing of the security question, okay? If you begin to understand the nature of the framing of the security question in Africa, it is framed as though a state needs to conform to a particular logic, a Weberian logic, okay? That's the point I'm making. So what you are saying is actually a critique of the Weberian logic. And I, I'm not too sure that we can debate too much that statehood takes different forms. I mean, one of the best studies you can use for this is uh, Basile Davidson's the, the Black Man's Burden, which begins to show the autochtony of the pre-colonial state in Ghana, for instance and how the lessons of that state formation process have been missed out in the contemporary notion of state formation. So, so let, let's not confuse the two. U.S. is a critique of the Weberian notion, which is a useful way of reminding us that it's not always a homogeneous story about the state formation. I could even uh, recommend a book by somebody called Hendrik Sprite. Um, I think it's called uh, The Sovereigns and Its Enemies which is a study of state formation processes in Europe, and which shows that before the current notions of the state modeled around the Weberian notion, that there were three possible alternatives in state formation processes. So it's not just in Africa that you have uh, alternatives to this particular narrative. Even in Europe, it was not predetermined that the current form of the state was going to be the one that was going to exist. Hedrick Sprite would be a useful addition to, say, uh, Basile Davidson's, uh, uh, and, 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 and I, I will, I, I've been putting together uh, an additional bibliography that I will email to the director for distribution around this. So I appreciate that, but it's a critique. The point I'm making, though, is that when you begin to think about notions of control of violence and the organization of the international system, 
it rotates around that attempt to homogenize the story of state formation. But even when you read Max Weber carefully, he actually presented his story as an ideal type. It was an ideal type. It was what would be the ideal form of the state. And he was reading from a very specific evidence in his hometown. Okay. So the point that I'm trying to say there that when you begin to think about notions of security, it's always about the Weberian idea of the monopoly of legitimate forms of violence. And I, I, you, 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 you raised your hand at a point when I was talking about Somaliland. Yeah? A place that has conformed to, to, to almost all varieties of, uh, of statehood, but which is not a part of uh, the international system precisely because it's not recognized at the UN. Or the pa Palestinian state, for instance, if you will. Uh, you seem to have a question here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and uh, thank you for the for the direction because I'm also worrying about time. But in a sense, actually, your question anticipates the argument that uh, that I'm trying to make uh, because it's a, what the globalization process is a part of the transformations that have taken place that, in a sense, render the idea that security is only a state, a national question. Uh, difficult to sustain, but I'm going to, to be responding to some of the uh, issues you raise uh, as I go along. So basically the point that uh, I'm, I'm driving at is that uh, the, uh, the logical assumption of that state security project was that security of the state, not of the individual of the community, is the primary objective of security provision. In other words, it's from, it was framed strictly from a, an ideology of order perspective an ideology of order that basically meant uh, that the key focus was going to be to ensure law and order. And how that was interpreted, one needs to go back and look at the post-independent constitutions in most African countries, uh, in which there was always in the Bill of Rights, in the Bill of Rights of most constitutions in Africa, at least I can speak very strongly of constitutions in the Commonwealth, there was always a caveat introduced in all the rights that were given to individuals. And that caveat said, subject to state security. When we went through the process of uh, constitutional review in Kenya, for instance, and uh, there was a huge debate about state security issues, and it was clear that the generality of citizens were not interested in the state security notion as it had been experienced, somebody still went into the government printers on the very last day when the document had been approved and it was now just going to be printed for signature, somebody still sneaked into the government printers and put in that caveat to emphasize that all these rights you are being given are subject to state security. Fortunately, civil society was paying attention. And when the initial draft came up, before they printed all of them, they pointed out that somebody had been playing a, a joke on this. And you can guess who it is but I'll not remove the security apparatuses of the state you know, from that you know, vigorous concern around issues to do with security. And part of the reason why this has continued to be a major problem is because security issues are consider considered largely as an elite project. I'm not simply talking about the ruling elite in terms of those ones who occupy government positions, I'm thinking about the elite across the board, whether in government or outside government, whether in the bureaucracies or in the business sector. Many of these people tend to have a convergence of what security should be about. And most of the time, we've tended to focus more on the political elite. But in fact, at the economic level, and in the security agencies, there is a convergence around issues of security. It, it goes back to the old framing by Walter Lippmann, the, 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 the end of American uh, uh, whatever, uh, um, 
media studies who said you cannot trust the crowds to know what is in their best interest. So the best way is to make sure that issues that are of consequence to governance remain among the elite. Who know what is in the best interest of those people? We used a very derogatory word. You call them the rabble, the crowd. Always idiotic, not knowing. They make too much noise, not knowing what is in their best interest. And it will be interesting again to consult Lipman. So you think about the elite project, a good many of whom have been, you know, in government or outside. When you change the opposition with government, you wake up and realize that actually the struggles in the opposition, in the civil society, for instance, when they get back to power, they still believe in a notion of security being primarily a state project. The military, the intelligence sector, the police, they all believe in that notion. So that there is a notion of securocrats, people who simply think that security is the province of experts in security. And therefore, the, the citizens have no role to play. Well, this old framework, this 17th century notion, has not yet dealt with the myth of the state as exercising monopoly of all forms of legitimate violence. This comes back to your question. It's a myth that the state exercises a monopoly of all forms of violence. In Africa, yes. In a larger part of the third world, yes. But also in many other developed societies. The state can be the state and work to provide security, but the state can become rogue. The state can sponsor private militia to be the source of insecurity. It can outsource all forms of illicit, illicit forms of violence. So that the assumption that the state will always exercise a monopoly of all forms of legitimate violence in the interest of people is a myth. Not just for Africa, but across the board. You, you just need to go and live in Chicago, or you live in the 1920s, 1930s in New York, where the state had formed, but where all kinds of illegal activities were happening. That, for me, is a myth. The second myth is that the state as constituted could address all human security needs of the people. When you begin to think about the UNDP approach, there is a sense in which the UNDP was talking to the states and it was talking to the international system framed around a statist logic. It was, not, it was talking to the state to be nicer to the people. Okay? And again, it's a mean that the state as constituted could address all the human security needs of the people. Many of the major democratic upheavals across the continent were about the inability of the state to address some of those issues, even in contexts where they could. Nigeria is a good example. Nigeria is a good example. With the oil boom and everything, the state was unable to address the human security needs of people. So that we need to get to a point where we are thinking about the changes that are happening at the political and economic levels and how they have consistently begun to push the idea of security provision away from the state into domains that we did not think about in previous times. And part of that shift was facilitated by the neoliberal project of the 1980s, 1990s, the structural adjustment era, which forced a rethinking of security a rethinking of the nature of state-society relationships at the economic level, with the neoliberal project demanding a retrenchment of the state, pushing for a liberalization of everything, pushing for the privatization of everything, one of which was the privatization of security. And there is an interesting debate happening in Africa in the 1990s around the neoliberal project around the structural adjustment programs. Um, I don't know about you, but I can talk about my experience. I was an undergraduate student in the 1990, 1989-90. And when we went to university in those old days, you went to the university and you expected the university to provide you with a scholarship and to give you some money to survive in the university. 
That was the assumption. The state funded your university work. And when you went there in the university, I don't know if any of you can relate to this experience. When you went to the university, not only did you expect that it will pay, you only expected it to give you a loan. And those days it was not a loan. They just gave you some money and you went around drinking and doing all number of things. Come 1991, 1992, as a result of these structural adjustment processes, they begin to impose school fees, university fees on us. So we go to the university and we pay for it. But forget about the higher education sector. Think about the health sector, for instance. In the old days, you woke up and you went to the hospital and you got treated. The state paid for it because you paid taxes. It was part of the social welfare bargains that most African countries had gotten out of the state society contract I spoke about. Come to 1991-1992, there is a demand across the board for people to pay for health facilities. And the state is willing in the 1990s to actually accept that citizens must begin to pay fees that citizens have no right to be employed, that citizens cannot access medical care in spite of the fact that the tax levels were rising across the board. And then the neoliberal project tried to touch on the security sector. And virtually no African government was willing to cede control of the security sector the way they had done for the health sector, the way they had done for the education sector. What is the reason for that? Because security continues to be treated as a special thing for which citizens are so ignorant they cannot participate in its core production. That neoliberal project changed a whole number of things, not just at the economic level, but at the political level. A part of the transformation then that also begins to take place happens on 9-11, the famous attack on New York, the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. Bill Clinton once said that he wishes that that had happened under him because it would have changed the nature of his administration completely. A good many of us tend to focus on George Bush. But the logic of that changing international dynamic was that the war on terror defined security in new ways, in ways that were you are either for us or against us. There's no one who is somewhere in the middle. And there's a whole, I think, 50-page national security uh, strategy that the US government did that basically began to redefine how security issues were going to be done at the international level. It is interesting to read that security strategy alongside Kofi Annan's book, Intervention, which was also beginning to think about how do you deal with issues to do with peace and security at the international level from a United Nations framework. They are also thinking about issues to do with responsibility to protect, for instance. Responsibility to protect being a lesson they had learned both in Rwanda and in Yugoslavia. There is a meeting in this major transformation that has been disastrous for issues to do with security provision on the continent. Why? Because the responsibility to protect provides a legal an internationally court accepted legal mandate for whichever powers to intervene in the affairs of another country in the interest of securing people who are under threat. The logic of the, the US, you are against us or you are for us, begins to envelop that discussion. And the consequence of that is that the notion of why one country should intervene in the other is altered completely, and I'm going to come back to that. But basically, the logic of the counter-terrorism uh, 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 whatever discourse has been that the local elite in many of our countries have tended to appropriate that argument in the interest, again, of state security. So whole populations are being renditioned across borders on the basis of that argument. Uh, opposition leaders are being arrested, detained without trial on the basis of the terror logic. And I can go on and on on this. The point I'm trying to make is that the shift in the landscape has been due to a whole number of projects. And you can begin to see 
um, that tomorrow I'll be talking about, for instance, the, that, how that logic plays out in East Africa. But there are examples about Boko Haram uh, with its own slightly different logic in Nigeria and Akim uh, in, the, in, the, in the Maghreb that we'll talk about. Now, having said that, I want to conclude by focusing on these four points. And to begin to say that if you begin to do an analysis of security on, and society with a focus on how transformations in society are altering the nature of security provision and security thinking, when you look at this, especially the first three points, you begin to see how major transformations are the result of these very processes. And I want to go through each one of them uh, one by one. Uh, the first one has to do with changing demographic profile in Africa and the attendant security threats that go with it. And I am isolating the idea of the youth bulge. Because the youth bulge has tended to be treated simply as a numbers game. We are having very many youth as compared to other populations. So it's youth as a ratio compared to the others. And the discourse around the youth in Africa, uh, uh, with a few exceptions, I'll mention exceptions, Mama Duduf's uh, analysis of the role of the youth in the democratization process in, in, in Senegal, for instance, uh, and Sinda Honwana's recent studies touching on the youth uh, in Tunisia, in Mozambique, and her study on uh, Africa in general, or any of the more laudatory studies that have talked about the Arab Spring, for instance. There are a few exceptions to that. But the general presentation of the youth bulge has either been on the numbers, and the consequence of that has been to present the youth as a risk. The youth in violence, the youth in uh, mass murders, the youth in vigilante groups, yeah? the youth in drug trafficking, the youth crossing all the way across the seas going to find a home in Europe. You can do an analysis of the NRM movement in Uganda and you are going to see how children are being deployed. You can do an analysis of all these movements. The presentation of the youth has tended generally to be a negative story. And I'm sure that we cannot turn away from the fact that indeed there are serious negative elements associated with youth mobilization. But I don't think we should put a full stop on the story of the youth bulge presenting the youth as a risk. Because the alternative side of that story is that the youth are at risk. It's a narrative of youth as risk, but there should also be a narrative of youth as risk. In other words, the youth bulge has put the youth in such a difficult environment that while there are forms of illegal and illicit activities that the youth are engaged in, there is also an alternative narrative of creativity, innovation, that we are not dealing with as a continent. So that on the one side there is a security implication of youth as risk, but on the other side there is a security implication around issues of innovation, of creativity. The most Pan-African people on the continent are the youth. If you want to see the logic of Pan-Africanism, you look in the youth music, for instance. Uh, you, you, you go to South Africa, you go to Kenya, they can relate to youthful musicians from Nigeria, from West Africa, from Senegal, we know all these people. It's not the same story among older people. So that we need to begin to think about the security implications, not that of youth as risk, but also youth at risk, and what that means for the reconstruction of our societies. But even more importantly, we tend to think about the youth category as not being gendered. When we talk about youth, we most often are thinking about the male gender of the youth category. We think about masculinity. And when we are thinking about security studies, if we can provide any way that there is somebody beyond the securocrats who can deal with security concerns, we think about the male youth because security is a masculine engagement. 
Well, what does it mean in this context of transformation? Not just to think about its gender makeup. Women and men, but also the age element of it. What does that do? Are the security concerns of an old woman the same security concerns of a young, young lady who just finished university is thinking about how to hit the world? Do they face similar security challenges? And I think from a methodological point of view, we need to be nuanced enough to begin to ask those little questions that enrich what we do. So that if you are thinking about that age and youth and gender thing, I think those are the issues. But even more importantly, the youth category begins to place on the table notions of marginalization and ex exclusion. And again, a whole bunch of youth exist on the margins of society. They, they are at risk. They have been able to mobilize all societies precisely because they have experienced what it means to be in the old uh, Marxist thinking presented by Fanon to be, to be, to be lumpen proletariat, if you will. And Fanon made the argument, you know, lumpen proletariats have nothing to lose but their misery when they die. If you have people who have nothing to lose but their misery when they die, how can you stop them from being a part of Boko Haram? That very notion of marginalization and exclusion around the youth question begins to alert you to the fact that there's a huge transformation that has taken place in society that is beginning to say the state project is not going to work. It does not matter how many guns, how many military battalions you put to these people. If they have nothing but their misery to die, there's a security consequence for it. And then, of course, that point I'm making touches on the notion of not just exclusion but radicalization, a process that uh, we are beginning to deal with in our societies in ways that we had not anticipated. Then the second point had to do with asymmetries, both nationally and within the international system. And I think the point I made previously around exclusion and uh, radicalization directly leads to this particular point. Why? Because there are asymmetries built in the international system. I think that's the point that uh, you are going, you are asking when you talked about the globalization process. There are asymmetries built in, in, the, in the international system in terms of how we understand and experience insecurity. But there are also, often we forget when we talk about globalization, that there are also asymmetries within our own countries, and there are also asymmetries within our own communities. So for instance, on security questions, the girl child is most likely not to be a point of reference when people are thinking about security, except if they want to paternalistically treat her as an object that needs to be secured. Generally, those asymmetries have different manifestations, and I think we need to be alert to that. And even more importantly, for conflict and post-conflict societies, how do you begin to deal with the asymmetries in the international system in relation to conflict and post-conflict societies? Now, Sierra Leone was lucky to have a set of people who designed a way of getting out of that post-conflict society with an eye to the developmental future, paying attention to development, paying attention to getting the politics right. Not too many countries have had that opportunity. And what are the security implications of not having those opportunities? Go to South Sudan. Barely five years ago, they were celebrating the emergence of this society, not just as an independent country, but as a post-conflict country. But without paying an eye to the developmental future, what are the key ingredients that make a society coalesce into one? Without paying attention to that, and some of our societies are almost always out of the institutionalized mechanisms of addressing peacekeeping processes and peace building processes. 
And those societies are asking for a different set of security interventions compared to if you are dealing with post-election violence in Kenya, for instance. And one can actually do a comparison between post-election violence in Kenya and the mediation process and its success and compare that to Zimbabwe, for instance. Or if you are too scared of Zimbabwe, try Cote d'Ivoire. But even if you are too scared of Cote d'Ivoire, try Syria, where the same Kofi Annan who tried to reestablish relations in society in Kenya tried in Syria and walked away and said, this is too complex for me. What kinds of security concerns do you want to put in this particular situation where the asymmetries and the power relationships are too complex and too entrenched for you to be able to build a thinking about security that begins to reflect the wider interests of societies. And of course, what tends to happen in many of our countries, going back to the myth of the state controlling all forms of violence, is that borderland zones tend to be neglected zones lacking infrastructure, lacking state security presence, lacking anything that makes a decent living. And if you think about most African countries, most of these borderland communities tend to be the zones where illicit activities begin to emerge. So that insecurity in relation to borderland communities needs to be an issue that we begin to think about clearly both from, as a state security project, as a human security project, but most importantly, by understanding societal transformations in those places. Because many of these places have suffered historical neglect. Can think about Casamance, can think about the northeastern part of Kenya, you can think about the north of Botswana, you can think about a whole range of places where historical neglect and marginalization of those communities characterizes the everyday livelihood of people. And if I was Al-Qaeda, if I was any of these terror organizations, what better place to launch attacks than to go into those neglected places? That's why Somalia was a, a nice place for Al-Shabaab to happen. It's not by coincidence that it was a choice place for all this. And so the question that we need to begin to address in relation to these asymmetries is that do they begin to deal with insecure spaces, neglected spaces, where insecurity is hatched nurtured and executed. And of course, the persistence of the statist logic in regional integrations. Many of the institutions we look at to help address the security question beyond the state tends to be regional organizations. A good many of them started as regional economic organizations. You can think about IGAD, you can think about ECOWAS, East African Community, SADAC. They all have security architecture. ECOWAS has done very well in managing uh, conflicts in the region. Well, I'm not too sure that I'm, I'm being very accurate in saying very well, but at least it has, it has the best developed mechanism. The African Union. But each one of those regional organizations is based on a state logic with an emphasis on the sovereignty of the states in interpreting the mandate they can accept or reject. Yet, the nature of insecurity that we are experiencing on the continent, for me, seems to suggest that it's totally impossible to force insecurity to remain within national boundaries. You are not going to keep Akim, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb within specific national boundaries. The tragedy of Al-Shabaab is that it can launch simultaneous attacks in Kampala and in Nairobi and in Arusha, if at all. So the old assumption that you can keep specific parts of society neglected and all that and assume that if bombing happens in those places, it's okay, was actually dealt a serious blow when Al-Shabaab staged a really sophisticated attack in an upmarket mall in Nairobi, killing among many people a relative of the president. 
a big signal that you can no longer begin to continue to neglect this. So the question then becomes, is there a regional mechanism for security provision? Are the frameworks developed by the African Union adequate to deal with security issues? Or the frameworks developed by the regional organizations? And tomorrow I'm going to talk to you briefly about the mechanisms from the East African community. Is regionalization of security strategy a solution? If it is not, why? Do we need, as academics, to begin to think about a new security vision and architecture that will begin to deal with these general transformations in society that we've not been able to deal with? So my proposal there is that we need to begin to deal with the stat statist logic built into the regional organizations. And finally, of course, one would ask the question, this is a story of doom, a story of hopelessness. Africa is, as Robert Kaplan said, the coming anarchy. The, that reading can easily emerge from, from what I've said. But actually, when you think about the numerous security challenges that African people have endured, you must wonder how these people have survived must wonder how they can still have a smile on their heads. And I think the notion of management of risk, the notion of resilience, is at the center of this. Unfortunately, as African academics, we have outsourced the study of resilience to the World Bank and to the Canadians. A lot of the literature on resilience, if you want, you go to the World Bank. They are doing a whole number of those things without acknowledging that part of the serious deficits of governance, part of the serious problems of insecurity, are the consequence, long-standing consequences of the reform packages that they initiated in our continent. So it's an invitation for us to begin to pay significant attention to resilience. And resilience doesn't always have to be positive. I spoke about the story of the youth. Occasionally it expresses itself in extremely illegal and illicit ways. But there are also licit and legal ways. And it has to do with guaranteeing personal securities. So in a sense, I also buy into the human uh, security project. Personal securities of individuals. People are using a whole range of customary methods to provide collective security. In some of the pastoralist communities in East Africa, you cannot survive if you don't have a gun in your house. For the state, having a gun is wrong because the state is supposed to provide to have a monopoly of all forms of legitimate violence. But the same state has abdicated in terms of providing, providing security for people. So you go to northeastern parts of Kenya and, the other, uh, and uh, the, the across the border into Uganda, you find people whose core property begins with the gun. Illegal, but providing a level of resilience because they can protect their hearts of cattle. And then, of course, the biggest, and Codesia has already run an institute on this. I'm not too sure that uh, a publication has come out of it. The privatization of security, both at local level in communities but also as a pro project of the state outsourcing the provision of security. As my, uh, one of our ministers in Kenya put it, this whole process of privatization has reached a ridiculous level because most people are going for private solutions to public problems. There is no way you can give a private solution to the security question by simply privatizing it. But that's something that is happening and underlying the resilience of communities. So in conclusion, let me just say that running through my presentation has been, it's no longer feasible to treat state security, state-centric notions of security provisions as sacrosanct. I think we need to push that boundary. The idea is not to replace the state. Again, that's the danger on the other hand. The idea is to begin to think about alternative ways of thinking about security provision in view of the transformations in society. 
And that's my second point. Recent societal transformations demonstrate a major shift in security conceptualization with a focus on collective societal needs. And finally, and I think this is an important point, co-production of security is therefore a way forward. It can be led by the state, but there must be active involvement, active participation by constituencies, actors who are attacked by security, including civil society organizations, including all those other actors who, in a sense, are able to understand the triggers of insecurity in ways that the state, I think, in Africa has been incapable of. Thank you very much.